What's up everyone? I'm back on the property to get some work done. I was hoping to be building my fence and getting my shipping container delivered on this trip, but the galvanized fence posts that I ordered for my fence are going to take a little bit uh, longer to get in than I had thought. And I've also decided to put my shipping container on a slab as opposed to just on the ground, so that's going to take a little bit more time than I had previously thought. But I have some time this week, so I'm here chipping away at it. One of my goals on this trip is to get my driveway graded and compacted a little bit more than it is. I actually got my van stuck in it uh, when I first showed up here a couple days ago. The sand is just so soft, uh, it, without any water it just doesn't compact. Uh, and uh, especially for when I have my shipping container delivered, I don't want, certainly don't want a semi to get stuck back here in the soft sand. I also need the area in which I'm going to place the shipping container to get flattened out a little bit, and also the area next to my well where I'm going to be putting my ground-mounted solar to power my well pump. I need to get that a little bit more flat. So what I've done is I bought a 500-foot roll of 3 quarter inch irrigation tubing which is ultimately going to be my uh, irrigation tubing for my field blocks. It'll connect my main line to my wobblers in my rows. But for right now, it's uh, a great way to just get water to almost any corner of the property. The from back to front, my property is 550 feet long. So with that roll plus a 100-foot garden hose at the end, I can... Uh, wet down my driveway all the way to the end. I can't quite reach to the opposite corner of my property. I think that's about 750 feet away, but I don't really have any need to do that right now. So what I've been doing over the past two days, I've been running the generator eight to 10 hours a day with a sprinkler head at the end of the hose, just dragging it up and down the driveway. And even just the just wetting it down heavily like that, I can feel it under my feet. It's a lot more compacted and firm than uh, driving my van up and down it a couple more times. It's it's much uh, firmer, and especially when I get a tractor in here that's heavy and he can uh, grade it down with the bucket a bit, uh, that's really going to help things. And uh, hopefully get my driveway more or less in a decent condition to use for the next few years maybe need to do uh, need to compact it periodically uh, but we'll see um, so i'm hoping to get the tractor in here in the next day or two i'm continuing to wet down the driveway and while i'm just running the generator and got the sprinkler going periodically pulling the hose up and down the driveway i am uh, starting to stake out and measure where my tree rows and field blocks are going to go and then I'm going through with a pickaxe continuing to clear brush, chip brush, mulch some things and yeah that's the agenda for the next couple days. Okay, I'm back at it this morning. Yesterday I got the driveway nice and wetted down for the tractor that's coming today. He's going to smooth it out and compact it more for me. He's going to get my shipping container uh, spot nice and leveled. Um, I spent a while clearing some more brush and chipping some brush. And today I'm just waiting for the tractor to show up. And after he's done, I'm going to take some of those rocks that I've been making a pile with and start to border the uh, the separation between my
tree row and my driveway. Uh, but I thought I would take a minute to talk a little bit more about the farm design and farm layout. So in my previous video I talked about how I want to incorporate as many permaculture principles into the design as I can. Um, one of the core and main design principles in permaculture is to harvest as much water off of the landscape as you can. And one thing that many people may have heard of is the idea of swales or key line water harvesting, which is the idea that if you have any excess water runoff on your property, if you're on any kind of a slope, uh, you want to slow and sink that water into your landscape to further facilitate uh, the growth of either crops or just natural vegetation or trees. Here in the high desert where I am, I only get six inches of annual rainfall combined with the fact that it's a very porous sandy soil. I've spent a lot of time walking around the property and that's one reason that I'm choosing to do most of the work myself and by hand with you know pickaxe, shovels, rakes and everything, clearing my field blocks. It gives me an opportunity to further just observe what's going on on the property. Little things like seeing mushrooms growing. Uh, it's been a bit of a surprise to me. I'll find these little uh, old dried up mushrooms around the base of some of the uh, sagebrush and stuff like that. Um, but I've also been paying close attention to looking for signs of runoff. I'm only on about a one and a half percent grade or slope here, which to the human eye, if you walk around, it feels almost completely flat, but it's got a little bit of a pitch to it. But um, with the extremely low amount of rainfall, it's six inches, but it's also usually spread mostly throughout the year. Probably the bulk of it in the winter, but the winter being four to five months long. And then, so say five inches throughout the winter, maybe one inch throughout the summer. We get a little bit of monsoonal moisture, usually in the summer, some rain then. Um, but I just don't see any signs of water runoff or really any opportunity to slow and sink any water into the landscape at all. So I'm choosing not to do any kind of earthworks at all because I don't think it would have any benefit to me. I don't think there's any water to really further sink into the ground. I think the poor sand combined with the low and spread out rainfall, I think almost all of it gets sunk into the ground just fine anyways. I don't see any signs of erosion. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what I have to say about earthworks. Um, I had touched on in my previous video about how I am going to be incorporating tree rows or kind of an alley cropping system into the design. Uh, one of the also core principles of permaculture is having a food forest and that is to incorporate many different varieties of fruit trees and perennial berry shrubs in a multi-tiered, multi-leveled um, guild. And I sp I've spent a lot of time thinking about and going over, I have a little uh, Google SketchUp drawing of my farm layout and I've many times done tons of revisions to it and thought about how I can lay out my field blocks, how I want them oriented, what kind of trees I'm going to be planting, species selection, variety selection, things like that. Initially I was thinking about doing just a uh, food forest on its own, fairly large block orchard multi-tiered uh, design and then having my field blocks all separated but uh, I, I thought that given the high wind nature or potential for high wind, definitely get some winds blowing pretty good up here in the high desert, I would, uh, an alley cropping system would be the best way of doing that. So essentially take what would be a entirely standalone large food forest and kind of break it up into strips and have them as a windbreak slash, you know, whatever microclimate 
uh, effect they can have on the field blocks that they are essentially enclosing would be the west, best way of going about that. So that's the design I'm going with. I'm going to be using uh, all the fruit tree varieties that I've chosen that I think will do well up here. That would be figs, pomegranates, apples, a lot of the stone fruits, cherries, jujubes, pawpaw trees, um, berries, goji berries, um, and then also some nitrogen fixing kind of pioneer trees, things that you would commonly see in a permaculture context. Um, that could be, or what, what I've chosen to use primarily are mesquite and mimosa trees. I, uh, where I am here with a water table around 25 feet, I think that I can probably get some mesquite trees to put their tap roots down into the water table. So mesquite apparently is a very deep rooted tree species. I think uh, I've read at least that they can uh, put their roots down as far as 175 feet, which here would be well into the water table. And so I'm going to do a little bit of experimenting and uh, kind of outside of the cultivated area here where I have my fruit trees, fruit tree rows and field blocks. I'm going to plant some mesquite trees kind of throughout the uh, property probably try to establish them on drip for a year or two just to kind of help them survive and uh, give them a little bit of uh, time to put their roots down and hopefully fingers crossed I can get their tap roots into the water table and then remove the irrigation completely so that's kind of a fun little experiment I'm excited to see the results for um, yeah so that's uh, what I have to say about the farm design for right now, I'm just waiting for the tractor to show up and uh, I'll shoot a little bit of that when he shows up. Okay, one more little tidbit before the tractor shows up. Um, one reason that I bought this property is due to the way that it's zoned. So when I first had the even idea of buying a piece of property to farm on, I was a little bit ignorant as to the rules around uh, residentially zoned uh, pieces of property and what you can do on them. And I think there are probably a lot of aspiring farmers uh, that maybe don't uh, know what uh, I didn't know when I first started out. I thought that you see like a vacant piece of land, you know, in a neighborhood or something like that, and you're like, oh, that would be a sweet spot to build a little urban farm. People would love that. It would look, look great, and it's not going to, uh, you know, it's much cheaper to just put in your minimal infrastructure to start a farm than to build a house and then a farm. But the way that most residential parcels are zoned, they have what is called a principal use. So if you look up the zoning in a given area or county, you will see that there is a principal use for a piece of property. And that basically means that the county wants you to, or requires you to fulfill that principal use before you do any kind of accessory use. And, uh, a most places most residential parcels there is only one principal use and that is a single or multi-family dwelling so i.e a house so believe it or not you actually cannot just take a vacant piece of residential land most of the time and build a farm on it without a house being there that's not the case with this piece of property here. So the way this property is zoned and these lots all around me are zoned is there are two principal uses for the land. And that is a single family dwelling, so a house, or the way it's worded in the zoning is orchards, gardens, field crops, and nurseries. So basically farming. So 
with it worded that way, you can have the principal use, meaning you could build just a farm and have only a farm. And then since you've fulfilled the principal use, you can then move on to accessory uses. Uh, and those are a wide variety of things, but one being like buildings. So uh, another reason that I bought this piece of property and I verified with the county here before I bought it and I asked, so does that mean that if I am farming the property, I can get buildings permitted and built as an accessory to that principal use of farming? And they said yes. So even though I am planning on building a homestead here and building a house and living here and having a, uh, a single family dwelling, I can uh, start farming it first and even get buildings permitted like my shipping container and I'm gonna have a garage built with my walk-in cooler and kind of my wash pack station, typical market farming stuff uh, in the garage all without actually having a house here. And that is not typical. You cannot do that most places. Uh, I, I can't say I've actually gone through that many different counties zonings, but uh, I know most places, especially as you get more urban, uh, that's gonna become more and more rare. I am in a pretty rural area. In fact, the zoning wordage on these pieces of property is RR or rural residential lots. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's one that kind of combined with the fact that there was a well here already that kind of pushed me over the edge to buy this piece of property it also being flat and me kind of thinking I could do what I wanted to do with it. Uh, that's one of the major deciding factors as to why I bought it and uh, I encourage anybody who's looking at buying land. Uh, or leasing like some empty land uh, look at the zoning first you might be unpleasantly surprised uh, about what you can and can't do with it um, so yeah oh yeah so uh, to add on to that um, so since I asked the county if I'm farming the land can I get accessories accessory buildings permitted to that principal use of farming, they said yes. But what that essentially means is I need to be growing stuff, at least in the eyes of the county here, before I can get like my shipping container permitted. So I'm gonna have to, and it's a little difficult because right now I'm having to haul all my stuff in. I gotta bring the generator in to run the well. I gotta bring my tools, my trailer, you know, my chipper, my shovels, whatever, all that stuff in I it would be so nice to have a shipping container here or some small building to be able to store stuff even before I start planting but I kind of got to do this little zoning dance here where I need to start planting out a bunch of my tree rows and my fruit trees and everything to fulfill that principal use in the eyes of the county before I can get like my shipping container permitted and I believe even my ground mount solar to run the well. So it's like I, I have to run it off a generator for the time being because I couldn't even get the solar permitted uh, to irrigate the trees that would fulfill the principal use to get the solar permit. So it's a little bit of a, a dance, but uh, yeah, that's my plan. So I'm going to be buying a lot of trees over the next few weeks and bringing them up here over the next month or two getting those planted, kind of getting my tree rows dressed up. Uh, I will be clearing the field blocks, but I don't think I'm really gonna be doing anything with them until the spring temperatures rise enough to where I could uh, start growing like a cover crop mixture. Uh, I don't think anything's really gonna grow that well when we have uh, consistent nightly freezes. Uh, but yeah, so that's a little bit of info on the zoning. Um, that's my plan and yeah, still waiting for the tractor.
Okay, there goes the tractor. He just spent a couple hours scraping everything smooth and clean for me. This is where the shipping container is going to go. It's a lot more level and compacted now. I can get my truck and uh, trailer all the way back here without issue. Uh, having wetted down the uh, sand for a few days now has really helped. It's nice and flat and compact and smooth. I'm stoked about that. There's a little bit of uh, stuff that gets pushed off to the sides that he can't quite do with the bucket. Also, I'll get in here with a rake and rake that smooth. Fence is going to go down this side. I'm going to start uh, pulling some of the rocks from my rock pile that I've been building today. And then uh, make my edge uh, that's going to separate the driveway from the first tree row that's going to be right here. And yeah, so stoked. That's going to be the plan for today. Okay, huge weather change here in the past 24 hours. Right after the tractor left yesterday, it got really windy, so much so I didn't really want to do much. There was a lot of wind or a lot of dust blowing. Uh, it probably got up to 40 miles an hour or so of wind uh, throughout the night. And I'm back here this morning. We got uh, the mountains are all dusted with snow. It's currently snowing up in the Sierra and in the uh, Inyo Mountains behind me. Uh, it's like 2 p.m. right now and it's probably about 50 degrees. I think the high today is going to be about 50. Uh, but I'm out here getting some work done. I uh, finally started bordering my driveway with these rocks that I had been piling up. I've got a big long tape measure here helping uh, guide me a straight line. I have uh, staked out the corners of my uh, tree rows with these rebar stakes and these caps. I have uh, learned, I started out with uh, using wood stakes for uh, my markers, but the rebar is just so much easier to hammer into the ground since it's such a finer point. I've moved to rebar stakes. So, uh, yeah, there's the rocks for the driveway separation between the driveway and what is going to be the first tree row so and i'm actually preparing to plant my first uh, plants tomorrow probably i uh, marked out a center point right here i'm going to put a russian pomegranate right here probably a mesquite right next to it and a couple other plants i've got so this right here right next to the driveway is going to be a 15 foot tree row going all the way down and then going this way you can see i've uh, I kind of cleared a little bit of a parking lot right here i can now i don't have to back my van down the driveway anymore i can uh, drive head in and then turn around in here this is uh, also the edge of one of the tree rows this is going to be a 15 foot tree row going that way this is this gap between this post and this post up here is going to be one of the 40 by 100 field blocks so that's 10 30 inch standard market uh, gardening beds 100 feet long and then here again is going to be another 15 foot tree row going right here and then again another uh, it's 46 feet uh, gap because i want 36 inch side um, pathways for wheelbarrows and larger uh, stuff the in in between the uh, beds is going to be 18 the very edges are going to be 36 inches this will be another block of 10 beds and then this will be the final tree row on this end i haven't put caps on them yet but there's one there's the other and then uh, so for measurement i've just got this big 300 foot tape measure roll and i have for a while now had my fence line staked out so this is the western boundary of my property and then i just pull a 15 foot measurement off of this and uh yeah, so that's looking pretty good. I like uh, finally being able to visualize where things are going to go now. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'm working on today. Probably won't get a whole lot more done. Um, 
Gonna be headed out tomorrow, but uh, I will get some stuff planted, which is exciting. Um, like I said, I've got this, I've got a Russian pomegranate, which due to my research is one of the most cold hardy varieties that you can get. Uh, so this is going to be going right there tomorrow. And I've got these tree tubes, which I'm going to put around them. Uh, they have these little zip ties on them. It's supposed to provide a bit of a little bit of a greenhousing effect, a windbreak. Um, they are perforated to actually split open if you get enough growth to uh, have that happen. But uh, I'll probably have those. I'm also a little bit worried about um, rabbit and rodent pressure here, especially planting such uh, yummy vegetative young plants in a relatively barren landscape. I think they might uh, look fairly appetizing to some of the wildlife, so I want to protect them. So uh, I might, uh, I'll probably use um, chicken wire baskets like this uh, for some things, the tree tubes for others, if anything is too bushy to uh, snake up one of these tree tubes, uh, then I will use the basket. Um, these are two different varieties of mesquite that I actually started uh, from some seeds that I bought on eBay. This is a uh, velvet uh, mesquite or honey mesquite. I'm actually not sure on that one because I can't quite tell the difference uh, in the leaf uh, structure there. This is a screw bean mesquite which uh, you can actually find, or supposedly find, growing natively around here uh, on the USDA plant database. There are some, uh, apparently some screw bean mesquite can be found in the valley uh, floor there. Um, so yeah, tomorrow I will get uh, some of those in the ground, uh, keep tidying up around here. I got, uh, did a little bit of uh, van compaction of the dirt right here. This is going to kind of be the uh, parking lot slash turnaround spot. Shipping container is going to go back uh, in this corner here. It's going to be a 20 foot container right there on a slab. Uh, the ground mount solar is going to go right next to the well here, 20 feet back from the fence right there, six panels. And then over here, got the compost pile and rock pile going, which uh, I've been using some of the rocks for bordering stuff. There's a lot more rocks to be uh, pulled out of the ground over here. Uh, I don't see nearly as many over here, but it's really going to take uh, clearing the brush, wetting it down, and then just methodically broad forking the entire thing to see if I uh, hit upon any more rocks. There are definitely some rocks uh, so large in this area here that I'm going to need to get the tractor in here and he's going to have to pull them out for me and even at that, like I said in the previous video, I may need to jackhammer some of them into smaller pieces or some of them might just be so large that I'm just going to have to work around them. Um, but yeah, beautiful day up here in the high Sierra, love seeing the snow. First snow of the year hitting the mountains up there. And yeah, we'll uh, check in tomorrow. Okay, I'm back out here this morning. It froze very hard last night. Uh, I got a whole bunch of frost on the inside of my van when I came out here this morning. The uh, hole that I had wetted down for the pomegranate was all icy and just solid ice on top. Uh, it feels like some of my hoses have frozen, so I'm guessing it got uh, probably into the 20s last night. I'm also realizing that I did not bring a good digging shovel, and it's uh, probably really going to help to wet down every hole that I want for planting trees. So for today, I'm just going to get this pomegranate in the ground, and uh, that'll be it for this trip. Okay, so the only uh, amendment that I'm going to add to this is uh, some mycorrhizal uh, fungi spores. This is the uh, 
Fungi Perfecti or Paul Stamets brand. Uh, I like all his books and uh, he seems to be a really knowledgeable guy on all things fungi. So there's a lot of different uh, mycorrhizal inoculants, um, but this is just one kind of little, it, it may not do anything. It's probably not gonna hurt anything. Uh, it's kind of a, in theory thing, it should work in practice. It's kind of hard to quantify, but I'm gonna be adding this to all my perennials uh, as I plant them out in my tree rows. So let's do this. This thing has actually grown fairly quickly. I bought these, uh, I ordered them online. Um, I think it was fastgrowingtrees.com. They came in little uh, number ones, I guess they are. Uh, a little less than a one gallon container. And I upplanted them maybe only a month ago or so. And uh, it's put out really good roots on the bottom here, so I'm happy with that. And like I said, uh, supposedly one of, if not the most cold hardy pomegranates uh, you can buy. I haven't really read much on if it's a good eating pomegranate, but I haven't really found a pomegranate I didn't like, so. There's some of the mycorrhiza. First of many. Um, I uh, said in a previous clip about how I'm not really going to do any traditional permaculture earthworks. Um, I guess one technique I am going to utilize is I am going to kind of dish around my perennials, at least when they're first planted. Um, so I go around and rake kind of a dish out and plant them with the crown a little bit below what the average grade is. So there will be a little bit of a collection uh, effect uh, in these holes, hopefully. And like I said, it doesn't rain much here, but uh, when it does rain, hopefully it will funnel down a little bit into the uh, planting hole here.
Okay, looks good. Okay, there it is, all uh, mulched up. I took some of the mulch from one of my rocks over there, mulched it up. I'm gonna be, this is kind of be, kind of going to be the format for all of my uh, trees and perennials. A little uh, planting dirt dish here with mulch in the middle. This one's gonna get a tree tube because I can squeeze that all in here. Uh, if it's a bigger planting, then I'll use like a chicken wire cage but super stoked first uh, real planting here on the farm i'm hoping to ultimately plant out over a hundred fruit trees of various different varieties and uh, yeah this is the first one there will be uh, many more russian pomegranates because i do think it will probably be one of the better varieties to grow up here and yeah so i'm going to uh, see about this tree tube here Bundle it all together. Boom, there we go. Doesn't look the prettiest, but it will protect it. And I expect that uh, middle of spring or so, Maybe summer, whenever it starts really growing, I'll be able to take this off. So this is just a little temporary home for it. Like I said, rodent protection. Just tighten up the zip ties on the back here. Yeah, and there it is. First planting, all tucked in. Good to go. Once my hoses thaw out here in an hour or two, I'm gonna give it a heavy watering and it will be good to go. All right, everyone, that's gonna be it for this video. I didn't get as much done as I was hoping to, but that's the nature of the beast, working on my own. And uh, on the next one, I really do hope to be starting my fence, if not completing my fence, along with my front gate and everything. When I have the gas auger in here for my fence posts, I'm going to do the ground mount posts for the solar system. Uh, definitely planting some more trees, probably another 30 trees or so. That will kind of check the box for the county so I can then get my shipping container permitted. Might start working on the concrete forms uh, for that. And yeah, really stoked. Uh, give me a comment. Uh, until the next one, peace. Thank you.